Ryan here in the Upper Egypt Galleries of the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. And we're looking here at a larger-than-life sculpture of Ramses II, who was a pharaoh in the New Kingdom of ancient Egypt. Right in the center of the gallery, it really dominates the space and seems to draw everybody into its, uh, its universe. Absolutely, and I, that's really what its function is. Um, really everything about this sculpture is about showing power, and I thought we'd talk about a little bit about that today, how that, how that works. Now, and this, this would be a representation of a kind that you would find in all different shapes and sizes, is that right? Um, I don't know about shapes, but certainly sizes, mm. um, from life size to larger than life size to colossal, of, you know, um, 20 feet and more tall. So where would this one fit in a, in a sense of scale, scale of values? Um, I think right around the, perhaps the lower end, there are other depictions of Ramses. For instance, there are colossal representations of Ramses at his large temple in Abu Simbel in Upper Egypt. And so speaking of temples, that's um, where this a sculpture like this, and in fact this very sculpture, was placed in a temple dedicated to Ramses. Okay, so in terms of function, this is not a display of power for the people? No, because really common people uh, wouldn't even be allowed into the innermost chambers of the temple. The priests would come and they would bring offerings uh, to the representation of the pharaoh. In fact, there's even a little dip in the sculpture itself in, oh, wow. front, of the, in front of his feet, as you can see right here. Um, and that's where some of those offerings would have been placed um, by the priests. Wow, that, that's fascinating because you don't often think of these as functional sculptures. You think of them as being, you know, kind of something to be revered. That's right. That's right. It sort of has a dual function in, the, in that sense. Mm. I mean, although we can't deny clearly the very overt displays of power and conventional displays of power that this sculpture shows. Um, for instance, things that we would expect to see in any representation of a great pharaoh, the linen headcloth, mm -hmm. the um, snake uraeus there at the top of his forehead. Um, the what's missing now, the inset false beard, that's also a conventional show of pharaonic power. And all this on top of an idealized body, right? So a, a heroic body type particular to the pharaoh. That's right, yeah. So um, besides just the um, trappings of power and the trappings of imperial power, we also have um, a kind of convention of showing the body type in a, in a powerful way with the musculature, the hands placed firmly and uh, flatly on the thighs as well. And this particular piece has some challenges to it, right? In, in addition to being pretty badly beaten up. Yes, it's clearly been um, damaged, broken into parts over time and reassembled. But uh, you, you might notice something a little strange about his head. Do yeah, you? yeah, it's a little tiny. And when you come into the gallery, um, you see this remarkable presence. And as you get closer to it, you can't help but feel that the head is a little bit too small. Why is his head too small, yeah. right? And the reason for that is that it's believed, actually, because of the style of the lower part of the body, that this sculpture was originally from the Middle Kingdom, that it actually was not at first a meant to be a representation of Ramses. Okay, so, so, so mm -hmm. repurposed. Exactly. Later, when he came to power then, the head was re-sculpted to mm. create a likeness of Ramses. And so, of course, with the subtractive method, that would make the head uh, be smaller. Wow, so, so the, the same head of a previous pharaoh, I guess by logical extension, a less powerful pharaoh. That's right, or is, someone it, who was succeeded by Ramses. And is whittled down to look like <laughs> right, Ramses. Exactly. Wow, remarkable. Exactly, right. It's pretty beat up, it's pretty broken. Yes, uh -huh. it sustained some heavy damage to the, at the waist that's cut clean through the, uh, uh, the neck as well. So the fact that it's quartzite, I'm, I'm guessing then that's not as hard of a stone as, as we're used to seeing. Right, and diorite is really the, uh, the preferred um, hard stone in ancient Egyptian sculpture, sculpture. But what's actually one of the advantages, I think, of the quartzite in this case is that because it's more porous, it retains some of the original pigment. Um, mm. it's, I think it's important to remember, and it's easy, very easy to forget, that all of this ancient sculpture would have been painted. Um, stones such as diorite, which is so um, hard and so dense, that paint has flaked off over the thousands of years uh, since it was painted. But with more porous stones, you can see that it retains some, some of the pigment. We have a kind of reddish tone to the, to the skin, and that's also an Egyptian convention to show the male figures with a kind of reddish skin tone. And we can also see the stripes that have been painted in the linen 
head cloth as well. Marvelous. I, I did not notice the color before you just pointed that out. Now I can kind of see the yellow and the blue, mm -hmm. is it, or the black mm -hmm. and the yellow? It's probably um, yellow and blue. If you think Remarkable. about uh, King Tut's uh, yes, uh, yes. cover of the coffin, it's yellow and blue, right? The gold and the uh, lapis, I think. Wow, you've changed the way I look at this sculpture now. That's remarkable. So the compactness of the forms would be the body, the arms close to the body, yes. and the stone between the torso and the arm is still there. Absolutely right. This arm's not sculpted free from the body at all, perhaps just in that little bit there that's, that, that's broken away. And that's, in fact, of course, why, it, why it's broken away. Right, so his forearms are missing, yes. but you can see the hands resting comfortably on the lap, mm -hmm. which would suggest no projecting parts, right? Nothing to break off. Exactly. So the body type we mentioned is uh, a heroic body type, that which we would expect to see of a pharaoh. But it, well, is it similar or different than we're used to seeing in Greco-Roman art in terms of, say, naturalism, in terms of a, a natural body? I think it's really quite different, don't you? I mean, uh, we have this very strong and muscular body type, but does it look really the way a, a, a human body looks in all of its naturalism? I think on it? first glances, people think so. I think they do. But if we look, I mean, if we look closely, the, the upper arm, the way it connects to the shoulder is somewhat awkward. These very thick, mm. um, these very thick shins with their big muscles and this sharp ridge of right. the shin bone. So a type, so a body type that's particular right. to the pharaoh, you can imagine if we had all the pharaohs lined up, we would see a consistency in the... That's right. Where really the most important thing is showing how strong and immovable and permanent the power of this pharaoh is rather than showing the way his shins and his toes actually looked. Right, but a consistency of the way he's represented Absolutely. so he's always recognized That's as right. pharaoh. That's right. Mm -hmm. So that, together with the trappings of his power, really they, those things work together to show that. So the permanence that we talked about before of the stone keeping the forms compact would work especially in the context of the tomb. Right, to keep things Yes, absolutely, because that ties in perfectly with the Egyptian belief in the afterlife, in this kind of eternal uh, presence or existence of the, the, the ka or the soul of the deceased. The long now. That's right. right? Yes. And, and the recognizable features uh, work in a political realm for people to recognize this particular pharaoh, but then also work in the tomb so that the Ka can recognize the pharaoh. That's right, because the Ka goes off and wanders around the underworld and here and there, but it always needs to come back and needs to recognize its, its home. Now, I wanted to say something before we, we end about the, um, the sheer number of images on here, the sheer kind of weight of the iconography. Yes, I think it's, it's important to remember or to distinguish between um, the image of the pharaoh himself and these other images that we see uh, carved around the throne. Uh, there's a difference between visual images and text. And uh, because that difference is very clear in our culture, images are pictures and text are letters, um, it's, it can be easy for mm. us to forget that these pictures, that these hieroglyphs are not pictures. This is text, and they're not uh, to be interpreted as uh, iconography, that a bird here doesn't necessarily mean a bird. A bird is part of this, this word, it's text. So almost like an illuminated manuscript. That's right, where the image is separate from the text and the text is not meant to be appreciated as uh, an aesthetic visual mm. experience. So you, so you get two different kinds of looking. That's right. Wow, so the, the iconography on the image itself is still enough to keep people entertained. The, the bull's tail, the, the uraeus you mentioned, the headdress. Um, any other symbols of unity that we would be accustomed to seeing, say, on Old Kingdom statues? Like yes, some things uh, carry through the pleated kilt, uh, the bull's tail itself, which we haven't actually mentioned before, which um, here actually appears to hang between the pharaoh's legs in the front. We're meant to imagine that as though it's coming down from, from mm. his back. Uh, that's also those kinds of symbols carried through throughout all three major periods of Egyptian art. So an expert could come and identify this maybe rather quickly as New Kingdom, but for non-Egyptologists there's a consistency of imagery from Old Kingdom to New Kingdom that's really quite startling. Absolutely.